Guys, so before we jump into this, I just want to say we've got a really big announcement, but we're going to save that for the end of the video. You guys have waited out more than long enough, so let's get into this. Semi-rogue semi-inquisitor Greg Sargent sighed and looked around for something to throw at the damn screaming servo skull. The immediate area had been depleted of disposable munitions, but a grope under the hollow table yielded a grimy yellow sticky note declaring do not remove this note. Sarge shrugged. Wadded the note into a ball, and hucked it the noisy servo skull, or to be more precise, the undeniably insane Margos biologist who'd somehow managed to install his brain in the thing. The sticky note fared no better than Sarge's previous projectiles, sizzling to ash midair as one of the skull's little macadamide zipped it and failing to disrupt Margo Smith's screaming rant on the nature of Xenos astropathic communications. Sarge got a bit more of response from the rest of the little war council, ranging from a small snort from the cheerfully stoic Rupert, a disapproving eyebrow from Alfred, and a profitless pistol from the captain, the cogitator adept, the only person in the room actually listening to the Margos, shot Sarge a half annoyed half apologetic look, and made a shooing gesture at his nominal superior. Sarge shrugged, muttered a hasty meeting adjourned and headed for the exit before anyone could come up with any more work for him to do. To say the debriefing had run long was an understatement. Without the old diplomacy adept to run things, getting the Margos to shut up was nigh impossible. Sarge would have given anything for the wily little geezer to return from wherever Oak had sent him, sock puppets and all, if only to have someone to relieve him in these emperor damned meetings. Amy had wisely fled at the 4 hour mark, pleading a homicidal rage, but Sarge was pretty sure that as the person in charge of the meeting, he was supposed to stay until it officially ended. Wearily wondering who he was even trying to impress, Sarge opened the briefing room door, took one step, and collapsed in a heap as someone jabbed a syringe into his neck. When Sarge woke up, he was naked, strapped face down to a table with the highly alarming whine of a power saw coming from somewhere above him, reacting with the berserk strength of someone who still had the majority of his limbs and wanted to keep them, the noncom talked his entire body against the restraints. The straps, having been designed exactly for this sort of thing, held tight, as did the vice clamped around his left wrist, less so the table they were all fastened to. Several people cursed as the table's upper half snapped free of the lower, and the entire assembly bucked into the air before crashing over sideways in a jumbled heap. Sarge had his unviced hand free now, if not the whole arm, and rooted around in the junk on the floor for something sharp to cut the straps. His fingers touched on some sort of handle, only to have it kicked out of his grip by a booted foot. So Sarge grabbed the boot instead, and yanked it with all the strength available to him. The boots owner gave a surprised yelp as they face planted directly on top of Sarge. The noncom strained against the head strap, managing to get his face turned enough to get a blurry image of his attacker out of the corner of his eye, until someone punched him in it. A single punch wasn't usually enough to put Sarge down, at least not one from anything smaller than an ogrin, but before he could continue his escape, the fight abruptly drained out of him. He closed his eyes to the sound of an exasperated argument over whose fault that all had been, and quietly hoped it wasn't his. Sarge's next awakening was accompanied by a lot of swearing, which was normal, but the source of the profanity was external for a change. He blinked as a goggled face wavered above him, drifting back and forth drunkenly, attempting to bring the wavering figure into focus somehow only made the effect worse. Sarge attempted to bat the nauseating figure away, giving the entire bed a good shake, but failing to part the thick leather straps tying him to it, Tink reached a steadying arm down to Sarge, arresting the bobbing movement of his grav crutches, and hushed the groggy noncom. Sure breaking you out of here, he whispered, glancing over his shoulder before setting to work on Sarge's restraints. We have 10 minutes until Valerie gets back, we gotta move. Sludge sat up, pushing Tink off of him, sending the techie in a surprisingly long arc across the room. Tink swore and fought with the controls on his grav chute, barely avoiding a collision with a light fixture and whining about how Sarge was going to spoil their stealthy getaway. Taking stock, 
and finding the majority of his appendages where he'd left them. Sludge pondered the sticky note adhered to his wrist reading IOU. 1. Hand Hannah. This was reassuring, as the cog girl was generally good about paying off her markers, and a lot less likely to hock the Arbeid's great augmentic for booze money than anyone else aboard. A second note, stuck upside down to his chest for readability, prescribed three drink maximum, one minimum, no spicy foods with Sister Valerie's illegible signature underneath. Sarge nodded vaguely, declining to argue with Tink's whole prison break narrative, and followed the hovering techie out of the med bay. Interlude, debrief, they were joined at the med bay's exit by Theo, dutifully performing his role as Tink's lookout from just beyond the med bay's no Xenos allowed sign. Sarge ignored the pair of techies as they chattered incomprehensibly, mostly about Tink's techno-heretical crunches, as they neared the barracks. Sludge was gratified to see the perimeter in good order, if littered with considerably more servitor bits than he'd remembered. Inside, the noncom was finally able to shed his annoying escort, Tink and Theo scurrying off to the section they'd claimed as a laboratory. Sarge idly noted that this section had grown markedly, nearly impeding on Twitch's munitions dump, where the demo trooper appeared to be holding some sort of class with the former trainees. The only other member of the squad present was Amy. The markswoman was sitting in front of Hannah, who at first glance appeared to be giving her a haircut. This theory failed to explain the mechanical contraption rolling around on the floor though, as well as the cable running from it to Amy's head, and the general lack of scissors. Amy waved at Sarge, and down on the floor, the small tank-like machine waved a claw in his direction. Welcome back to the land of the living. Fearless leader how is the shotness of your ass behind her? Hannah snickered. Sarge ignored the inquiry, aside from giving the region in question an exploratory scratch, and gestured at the mysterious device. What is this and why is it wearing cat ears? Amy grinned. It's a cat Sarge nodded, as if this explained anything at all, and looked at Hannah instead. The cog girl gestured a macadam right at an invitingly empty chair next to them. We are a sanctifying her mind impulse unit, and since I couldn't find a banner blade to calibrate it with, we're using my cat. Now sit down. Once we're done, we'll get started on your hand. From his corner, Tink raised his voice. So you're saying you'll give Sarge his hand job once Amy is done playing with you? The techie broke off as all three members of the conversation turned to glare at him, and exercising his one functional social grace, shut his mouth and turned back to Theo. Sarge settled into the proffered seat with the weary sigh of a very busy man with a valid, if temporary, excuse not to be. Dropping him from their attention, Amy and Hannah resumed what, if they hadn't been a goodswoman and a tech priestess, would have been defined as gossiping. The main topic seemed to be all the horrendous things Margot Smith had been up to, from the ongoing squig infestation to his turning most of the lower decks into his personal manufactorum. After he took over our Faraday clubhouse, gossiped Hannah. This was the only place left on the ship secure from the madman. At least once he ran out of defuser servitors. Amy nodded. Just don't let Twitch know or heal from the back of the room. There was a shout of too late. Followed by maniacal laughter. The cog girl shrugged. The discussion turned to Hannah's new cadre of recruits, who'd settled in surprisingly well given the circumstances of their recruitment, with their senior tech priest somehow winding up working in hydroponics with the tribals. Despite Sarge's best efforts, he felt himself beginning to nod off, at least until the breaching charge went off. Acting on pure instinct, Sarge launched himself upwards. Unfortunately, those instincts had a rather out-of-date theory about the number of hands in his possession, not having been designed to support a hundred plus kilos of noncom on one arm. The chair flipped over, taking said noncom with it. From his newfound position on the floor, Sludge listened to the sound of flash grenades and LAS fire coming from somewhere behind him, reassured by the steady firing cadence of a squad picking their targets and the general lack of screaming. He relaxed and decided that his current position was actually quite comfortable. Unfortunately, while well comfortable, the position was not secure, and immediately fell under attack. Somewhere above him, Amy and Hannah giggled as the cat rolled forward, 
prodding him with its claw. With a put upon groan, Sarge abandoned his position to the enemy's overwhelming assault and levered himself upright with the existing hand this time. Ignoring the muffled snickering behind him, he stumped off to survey the literal battle damage at the rear of the bay. The breach in the wall had been done cleanly enough, with clear signs of having been pre-cut and not going through any power conduits or sewage pipes. Sarge skirted around the blast shields that had been erected around the breach and looked inside as the last of the LAS fire trailed off. In the middle of the flare-lit bay, Twitch was triumphantly holding up a leaking purple ball of teeth and quills, and loudly declaring it to be a scroot, not to be confused with a crook. The four flak armored men around him nodded attentively, and as Sarge's non-combined brain automatically examined their kit, posture, and weapon discipline he allowed himself a bit of sergeantly pride in the newly founded Team Rupert. The floor around the little group was littered with a combination of screwed bits, shredded packing material, and a worryingly large number of human skulls. Sarge picked his way across the floor inspecting the nest like detritus. It was relieved to discover almost all the skulls to be old, clean, and wired with bits of electric junk. Twitch explained to his captive audience that the critters had probably been living on the servo skulls everyone kept sending to spy on us. Sarge cleared his throat, and the squad came to a gratifyingly swift attention. Barracks, grunted Sarge. Twitch nodded smartly. Carry on. His duty done. Sarge turned his back on the proudly straight-faced squad, and headed back towards his comfortable chair. As he drew close, Amy waved a hand and cheerfully explained Nubby sent them to Alfred. Cause he always knows where to find our best digs and Alfred sent them back with a very polite note about us being the hosts here and doing our fracking jobs. Hannah paused and looked at Sarge too. Was it Scroots or Krug's Scroots? Hannah swore and tossed a Munitorum cocoa flavored fructose bar to Amy, who accepted it with a good grace of someone getting her brain augmetics poked at. The cog girl expanded. Tech priest Lagbolt sealed it for inspection when he found a bunch of nubby's stuff in there. She grinned. Before he got demoted to junior Angensia 7th grade, Hannah poked something on the data slit, and on the floor the cat turret started to rotate spasmodically. We tried to send some skulls in to get to the interior override, but the crutoids got there first. So after the third we just decided to leave it be. Sludge raised an eyebrow. Lot more than three there. Hannah nodded. Probably all the skulls people send to spy on you. Didn't Twitch tell you about them? Amy smirked at Sarge's look of disgust and munched her fructose bar while the cat waved its turret claw in a series of increasingly obscene gestures. Sarge's hand was somewhere between the on fire and the reflexively death clenching stages of augmetic ray connection when the supply convoy arrived. Announcing their presence via a psychic shout for anyone who wanted dinner to deactivate the perimeter mines and come carry shit. Fumbles and Nubby carefully brought their grocery pallet through the front kill box. The hall seemed like a good one, with actual food like smells coming from some of the boxes, and the aggressively bland labeling of Munitorum alcohol rations on some of the others. Sarge began to rise with the vague goal of asserting some semblance of order on the unloading process and asking Fumbles where Nubby had gotten it all, only to be yanked back into his seat by Macadam right around his arm. Hannah growled something in binary, and Sarge flinched as another nerve connection snapped into existence. He decided to stay seated. Doc arrived as the chow was being laid out, unexpectedly accompanied by Chief Medici sister girlfriend Valerie, who viewed the barracks as something just short of a Nurgle cult lair. Equally unexpected was the cogitator adept, who held similar views, particularly regarding Twitch and his idea of security, which was probably why Jim was carrying him. Interrogator Alfred's presence bringing up the rear, calmly chatting with the near-hysterical adept and carrying a stack of kit bags and data slaves taller than he was, seemed as perfectly normal and unexceptionable as it always did. Team Rupert's surprise at their newly issued perfectly fitting evil inquisitorial goon uniforms was amusing, as was Alfred's recollection of us receiving ours and Nubby's third hand account of what happened to Sarge's uniform. A sort of ad hoc banquet formed around the table where the most food-like boxes had been deposited, drawing Tink and Fio away from their project, 
and twitch away from duct taping every wall seam in the scroot bay. Tink flinched at the sight of Sister Valerie, bobbing over to urge Sarge to hide before she noticed him, earning the techie an eye roll and a tart comment about having literally left a note with a drink limit stuck to Sarge's chest. Twitch pride opened the first crate of Munitorum liquor, revealing the finest of Nusquin fungus wine. The second crate at least didn't list its ingredients and vaguely identified itself as beerish, and was breaded up to first crate, despite Alfred's insistence that it was actually a very commendable vintage. Sarge freed himself from Hannah's clutches, his augmentic feeling almost as normal as constantly wearing a power fist, and tried to guess whether any of the other ration crates would have something more drinkable in them. It was Nubby who raised the topic of oak. Whining about how the Inquisitor had absolutely no sense of gratitude. If this dumb boxy feng was so important, why did he go and send us off with bloody bane bastard was trying to kill us this was a well worn topic. At least the is oak trying to kill us part, but for once it wasn't immediately followed by Twitch's knee jerk yes interrogator Alfred cleared his throat, and when that didn't work, sent out a little psychic nudge. Earning him several dirty looks and a whispered no psychic powers at the table from fumbles, but it did at least get everyone's attention. Alfred set down his glass of fungus wine, I believe that he may simply have forgotten. You see whatever response Alfred expected, it wasn't nubby to cut in and declare nah, we thought of that, but the Quisitor is one of the myodid memory brain augmentic fingies, like a cogboy or a cogitator weenie. He gestured at Hannah and the adept, and that means he doesn't fudge at nothing unless, interjected Twitch in a surge of manic excitement, he forgot it on purpose there was the usual chorus of groans from around the table, but the demo trooper ignored them. No, shut up, this makes perfect sense how do you hide secrets from a bunch of sickers who can read them right out of your brain you delete them from your own mind he paused, hyperventilating, it's genius, absolute genius and it explains everything there was a collective pause as everyone mulled this over, until Amy broke it, that's the stupidest idea I've ever Alfred raised a polite finger, actually, god fucking emperor damn it the markswoman slouched in her seat, muttering to herself about the unfairness of the universe, Alfred sighed the sigh of someone whose big surprise had just been spoiled by a smelly little idiot, and asked first, where exactly did you hear that? Corporal Nubs Nubby, sensing danger, immediately threw his comrades under the bus. Tink said Theo said at the far end of the table. Theo looked up in vague confusion until Tink whispered something to him. The little Xeno scientist nodded. Mago the fleshsmith screamed he would instill one in me if I penetrated his perimeter. Taking in the confused looks this statement earned, he expanded it was a very flattening offer. The design being devised by himself and made with brain matter cloned from the most adequately intelligent of inquisitors. Alfred sighed again, and picked his wine back up. I would like to ask everyone present to meditate on the effectiveness of a secret anti sicker memory alterer if it stops being secret, and kindly keep their mouths firmly shut. I had my own suspicions after Inquisitor Quercus assigned both you and that madman as our backup, it being such a deliberately terrible fit but I'd assumed it was some traitorous underling. Alfred's unobtrusive demeanor began to drop away as the man grew engaged in his story, but it was on one of my rare encounters with Quercus that it occurred to me that his mind was not just exceptionally open to psychic reading. It was deliberately that way. Even as minor a sicker as myself could sense the plain truth of his words, even when speaking of things I personally knew to be secretly false, Fumbles nodded in confirmation. I could hear him from three rooms away. It was super weird. Likely was constantly talking to himself, explaining what he was currently doing, even when he was doing something completely different. It was very hard to talk to him. Alfred hushed the young sicker with a gesture and continued. I'd asked a casual question about the gene seeds recovered on our mission to that uncivilized backwater and realized the Inquisitor's version of events perfectly matched that in our reports. The point being, that we'd reported only half the number of untainted gene seeds, omitting multiple batches from our inventory at his express direction. Either the man was the greatest liar I've ever encountered, 
or he really did believe that we hadn't found any ultramarine descended seeds in the hall. Alfred sighed again. I was going to explain the whole process of deducing the existence of his augmentic memory alterations, but apparently that's not necessary. Across the table, Fear worriedly asked Tink if he'd done something wrong, but Alfred waved forgivingly at the little Xenos and turned to Twitch. In essence, yes Twitch. Inquisitor Quirkus secretly edits his own memories as an anti-sicker security measure. The demolitions trooper puffed up with vindicated paranoia, but remained silent as Sarge leaned over and rested his heavy augmetic on his shoulder. Alfred nodded in appreciation. I believe the Inquisitor reserves this technique for matters dealing with the conspiracy. Keeping himself on a need-to-know basis Amy broke in with a sneer. At least he doesn't ask his troops to do anything he wouldn't do himself. Scoring a few chuckles and a disapproving look from Alfred. Alfred continued, and putting great trust in his allies and subordinates' abilities to implement his plans. Nubby raised a hand. Alfred sighed in anticipation. And so when EE -E needed someone super dependable and trustworthy for his self-secret mission failing, EE -E picked us Alfred nodded gravely. Yes. Why in the Emperor's name would EE do that? Presumably all the better options are either busy or dead. It was one of Team Rupert who raised the question of just what the Necron QB thing was and if it had come off the same Necron scout vessel that had killed 75% of their graduating class. It was hard to say whether it was Matt, Max, Mac, or Mark that asked. Only Twitch seemed to be able to keep track. And since they all called each other by their former careers just like we did, it didn't particularly matter. In any case, the scribe's question led to more questions, and to our genuine surprise it was our former trainees regaling the table with dubiously accurate recollections. When the story got to Cutter's last stand, Doc was both surprised and embarrassed as Sister Valerie slightly drunkenly gushed over how he'd killed two traitorous starts, obviously viewing his administration of combat stims to the wounded as perfectly in line with imperial medical practices. Nubby sees the opportunity to take the spotlight, and that's when I personally recovered that fancy Archiatech box thing what darn nutty cogboy was trying to take. Savin it from the mean and orbital bombardment, and dutifully turning it over quizzer to thankless bastard. Tink, who'd stayed remarkably quiet through the whole thing, looked from Nubby to the rest of the squad with his mouth hanging open. You had a tesseract labyrinth and you gave it away Nubby glared back. It wasn't like the Quisitor gave us a choice or nothing. He paused to scratch thoughtfully at a boil before continuing. Nor the Terrogator neither for that matter. Packed us on da first ship back ta oak da second ee saw it. Twitch nodded in affirmation. Told us we'd all be killed in horrifically painful ways if we discussed it with anybody. Wait. Asked Amy. Oak the Interrogator and which one was this anyway the one that got arrested? Or the Sissitut guy both? Answered such before anyone else could, and it wasn't either of those assholes. It was the I. There was a pause while the noncom tried to recall an actual name before giving up with a shrug. The one with the data slate. Surprisingly, almost everyone present nodded in understanding. The notable exception was the cogitator adept, who stared in disbelief. You I do realize that interrogator Almas is the Inquisitor's actual interrogator, as in. The answers directly to Inquisitor Quercus's revelation was met with several blank looks, and Tink pointed across the table. Yeah, so did Sarge. At least until Ivana tricked him into being an Inquisitor, and the adept worked his jaw, presumably attempting to come up with an answer that didn't involve calling everyone present idiots. Fortunately, Alfred came to his rescue, as in, he's the Inquisitor's executive officer. While Sarge was just part of the command squad, this gloss was met with general approval. Amy, who'd recently spent several weeks traveling with both Oak and the interrogator, asked the obvious question, the hell was he doing babysitting you idiots on a training detail mostly playing with his data slate? Supplied Doc. I mean aside from that, one of Team Rupert raised a hand. Getting a bunch of us killed by Necrons exactly interrupted Twitch. Oak wanted a Necron box, right and his O just happens to personally send us to a planet where one just randomly shows up it all fits everyone present look to Alfred, who nodded in reluctant support. 
There was a series of groans around the table as Twitch pumped his fist in the air and started rapidly expounding on how Oak had obviously been manipulating our missions to an agenda so secret not even he himself knew it. Before this digression into Oak's theoretical plots could pick up too much steam, Nubby cut Twitch off. What I want to know is what's so special about Distessa Fingy anyways. Tink leaned forward in excitement, drifting slightly over the table until Fio helpfully pulled him back. It's a Xenoarchia tech device containing a sealed pocket dimension capable of holding anything Nubby's expression perked up in interest. What we talk in ton age wise air cause I know this guy what does some off da books ship in hood Sarge gave Nubby a medium strength glare, which the grubby trooper deciphered easily. I means, if we hadn't already turned it over to da proper authorities, Alfred cleared his throat. Actually, you didn't. The proper authorities in this case would be the Ordos Milius, as these devices are the only known way of permanently containing a demonic entity, and only they know the secrets of their use. Fio looked at Alfred quizzically, really it did not seem covertly difficult to disentangle, the table fell silent, and Alfred gave the Xenos a paint look as he poured himself another glass of fungus wine. I suppose the Margos told you about that too Fio nodded, then caught himself and shook his head instead. No, Mago the fleshsmith had me designate the interface myself, as he was over encumbered instilling the Xeno Psycho Scenes Introducer and the hexadecimal containment words in all the skull boxes. This time everyone stared at the short TAU Xeno technological genius, with the exception of Jim and Hannah who shared a burst of something in binary. Fiu took in the looks cheerfully, does this mean I am of the Ordos Malias now no, replied everyone. Fiu's rambling explanation of what he and the Margos had done to the boxes to turn them into some sort of demon trap was almost impossible to follow. The bit about activating the Tesseract with some sort of Imperial TAU hybrid field thingy was simple enough, if only because we'd seen that Necron ship he'd worked on and were willing to take his word for it. Even Fio found the whole concept of psychotechnology tricky though, and it was hard to say if the drinking was helping or not. As Tink finally put it, so how it works is the skulls are all, like, former inquisitors who've been possessed by the demon I prefer, extra-dimensional psychoenergic entity, added Fio unhelpfully, Tink ignored him, and because it possessed them, they still know its unique phonetic signature. Creating a multi-directional psychic correction between them and the Tinkush the Xenos. Name. The Deaders know the demon's name. So Margo's screamy skull put together some sort of wraithbone circuit board thingy to automatically trigger a sort of scenes. Thingy. He paused, looking back to Theo. Which summons the dead Inquisitor's ghost semi-sentient warp echo. Ghost. Which in turn uses the demon's name to summon it into the, uh, psychoplanar pocket realm ghost dream. The ghost summons the demon into the ghost dream, and traps it there. And then the other boxes summon the first box actually it's the entity itself that and they just eat each other until it's a demon in a box in a box in a box. Because it's too strong for just one of them to hold it. Doc raised a polite hand, but all three together will be enough to hold it Tink shrugged and looked to Theo. Yes, for up to multiple hours, the mago told me. Tink nodded sagely. Yeah, so, probably important to get the tesseract put back before Oak tries to use it, as Tink wound down. Sludge put down the last of his prescribed beverages, and assumed the briefing pose. And that, guardsman, is why we're on our way back to inquisitorial headquarters. Tink, Twitch, Doc, Nubby, and everyone else who'd been spared the ordeal of the debriefing started swearing. Sarge correctly interpreted this as a general inquiry into the strategic situation. First, shut up. Second, roughly six hours after we departed the system, Oak warped his battleship into the system and surrendered himself to inquisitorial authority. Doc raised a hand and asked the inevitable question, why in the Emperor's name would he do that dunno? Maybe he expects the demon to come to his trial or something Sarge shrugged. In any case, we need to get back before those boxes are brought in as evidence. Or shit's going to go sideways. Hard, how hard Alfred raised a finger if I may. Inquisitor the interrogator took up his own pose standing over the table. 
gesturing at the detritus of food boxes and empty bottles as if it was a hololithic tack map. Currently, three quarters of the inquisitorial fleet has been dispatched to counter the sudden inexplicable appearance of a tyrannid splinter fleet in the region, and won't be returning until their navigators recover from the psychic shock of that unholy abomination the Margos is keeping up in the astropathic sanctum. The Mago calls it the Xenophantasmal Warp Jammer, explained Theo. We calls it a demon throp, added Nubby, or Frank. Alfred silenced the commentary with a look, delightful, in addition to its use as a psychic weapon and masquerading as a trianid fleet, the Margos assures us that the Abomination's warp shadow will block all astropathic communication, cutting off inquisitorial headquarters from many reinforcements, and, added fumbles with a glance up through the ceiling at something nobody else could see, give anyone over delta sensitivity one hull of a headache until they get used to it, Alfred nodded to his fellow Sicker and continued, of the remaining inquisitorial fleet assets, several have yet to return from a mission to Harlock's wager, and most of the remainder is tied up picketing Inquisitic Workers Battleship and its attendant vessels. This leaves the Astra Militarum task force being mustered to counter the non-existent Tyranids as the primary power in the system, with Lady Amelia's mother commanding. Amy groaned at both the title and overall situation and hid her face in her arms. Alfred ignored her. Between them, a Mechanicus task force, six Death Watch destroyers, and strike cruisers from the Lamenters and Grey Knights chapters. The conspiracy's void assets are heavily outnumbered. Sludge nodded. And along with all that, Amy's mom has nine regiments of guard, all ready to drop on Inquisitorial HQ and purge some gene stealers. Assuming Oak can smoke them out, the table fell silent, pondering the sheer scale of the Charlie Fox trot looming before them. After several seconds, Doc asked the question, and if he can't Sarge attempted to do the whole look around the table and meet everyone's eyes to establish the seriousness of the situation routine, but gave it up as a waste of effort before he even made it to Nubby. Instead the tired noncom flopped back into his seat and stared dolefully at Sister Valerie until the medic he pityingly held up a single finger and Doc passed him a final drink. And if he can't, we're so fracked we might as well just go back to the penal legion. Sludge paused and cautiously sniffed the Munitorum issue beverage before raising it in a toast, so here's to the Inquisitor, and pray to the Emperor he's better at this shit that we are. Next time, the trial of Inquisitor Quercus. Oh, that's a nice build up to the beginning of the end, although Shoggy's been saying this is the beginning of the end for, what, like, two years now? So, he's been working on a few different projects, and they're actually really interesting projects. To stay up to speed with them projects is he has a Twitter and a Discord, both will be linked down below, but the big project that he's working on is, and I've been past going to do this for absolutely years, and he said, no, I'm only going to do it whenever the All Guardian Party is finished, but because it's so close to being finished anyway, he was like, you know what, like, let's just do this. So he's going to be doing a Kickstarter for All Guardian Party miniatures. The models that he has so far look absolutely amazing. Um, I worked with the same artist before, so I have. They're actually the same artists that did me and Megan's official um, models, so I think they look really nice. And, uh, look, they're almost finished. I don't know when the Kickstarter will be going live, so therefore that's why you gotta check out his Discord and check out his Twitter and all that stuff. He does have some other stuff going on, but... Look, I don't want to. I don't want to bore you too much with all the minutiae. You're going to find all them details. But if you want to, like, if you want to stay up to speed with the old guardsman party, check out the Discord and check out that Twitter. That's the only thing I can tell you guys because how long has the old guardsman party been going on for now? Like, what? It's I think it's like six years, maybe seven years, which is kind of insane when you think about it. But it's such a good story, and how like you guys are still here after how many years? You know. So I think it's definitely that, you know, look, the best way to keep up to speed is by following Shoggy on his social medias and his Discord. I think that's everything. Um, I don't know if there's anything that I'm missing, but uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. And he is currently working on the last part. And he says it won't be too long. So let's just, let's just hope and we'll find out. But I hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you next time.